You're listening to the Flex Success Podcast, where we teach you how to be less shit. I'm your co-host, Lizzie, and this is Dean. We'll be covering all topics relating to health, fitness, and bodybuilding. Join us as we use our in-the-trenches experience and up-to-date science to provide you with information that you can actually use. If you like what we do, be sure to give us a like, follow, share, and tag us on social media. We're back, everybody, another Flex and Test podcast. Today, we're joined by original co-host, Lizzie. I was going to say, as always, but not really, as always. You, you, sometimes you're here, sometimes you're not. And then sometimes we've got I'm special replaced guest. with my bearded, got my bearded friend. The bearded version of Lizzie in, in Coach George, yeah. yeah. He's with us as well. And then That's we've got cool. a special guest today. <laughs> Blake, mate, I was I was going to try and pronounce your last name, but I thought I might I might butcher it, so I won't. Blake, Flex and Test athlete. Dimming. Colleton. You got it, mate. Straight yes. up. It's pretty hard. Yeah, it's pretty you easy. You never know. You, you never know. Double L's and stuff. People on stage that go Colton instead of Colton, like it all the time. Yeah, there you go. So, mate, welcome. Uh, Thank before, you. Before we throw it to you, mate, I thought we'd we get you on. You're a, a client of George's, but George, do you want to give us a quick little introduction to Blake uh, as a, as an athlete of yours, mate, so everybody knows who he is. I mean, Blake is one of uh, my few pros. He recently turned pro this season in his second season of competing and then went on to get his Olympia qualification, uh, which was pretty fucking remarkable in his second season of competing. We've been working together since not long after Nationals last year, where we met in person. And since then, it has just been a pretty remarkable week after week after week, every single week, as we've watched him kind of explode in his first kind of novel years of bodybuilding. It's been uh, pretty remarkable to watch. Mm -hmm. I'd say there's uh, definitely some added layer of interest and difficulty and challenges with Blake that are different to most people due to his circumstances, which I will happily pass on to Blake to give a little information about uh, now shortly. So, big man, give us a little rundown on you. Yeah, so um, I'm in a wheelchair as some of you may know, but uh, so I'm paralyzed from like chest line down. So like nipples, I can't really feel much from that area down. Don't have much um, muscle activation below that level either. But uh, just over time of doing bodybuilding, I've kind of activated a little bit of my lats. Um, my abs don't actually work, but I can hit on them and they tense up. You might've seen me on stage hitting my core like a maniac, just trying to get my abs to stay on. <laughs> But um, it just holds my stomach in, gets the abs on, um, and looks a lot better. I had an accident in motocross like 10 years ago. That's how I ended up in the wheelchair. So, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, some pretty cool things that I've noted from Blake and obviously talking to his parents when I've met them in a couple of times is that this kind of mindset and the way he holds himself isn't something that's new. This isn't bodybuilding that's brought this out of him. He was like this at motocross, according to his parents. And obviously speaking to Blake, he's always had this kind of athlete driven mindset where he puts his his goals and what he's trying to achieve very much at the forefront of his decisions it's been a uh, pretty impressive to be around and you can see straight away where that overlap makes bodybuilding quite uh like very magnetic for him like he was drawn to that kind of behavior and uh, how he lives his day-to-day -day life which is pretty pretty damn cool um, just for anyone who may have seen some of the pictures and images of Blake on stage, so as you said, he, he doesn't quite have uh, any kind of real feeling of his midsection. And obviously, because of that, there is a lack of development. And some people might be a bit confused when they look at like bodybuilding criteria and try and wonder where they put the placing. So different to a normal bodybuilding, it is judged by open bodybuilding standards, but they take into consideration each athlete's personal circumstances. So obviously for Blake, as he said, from the nipple down, he's paralyzed. When they look at the judging, they're not actually taking into consideration his midsection because, of course, it's not a muscle that can be developed. Whereas other athletes may be from like a lower point on the, the spinal cord injury, they may be closer to the hip, so they have control of the midsection, and in which case they take that into consideration for the overall uh, balance of condition in muscularity, etc., similar to bodybuilding standard. Mm. Well, Liz <laughs> ponders that thought. I was going to say so. Is symmetry less of a consideration than given that there may be asymmetrical issues with people that are in wheelchairs? So I think, again, it becomes specific to the person from what I figured out from watching the judging. Now, obviously, like for Blake, top line symmetry, shoulders, traps, arms, there is an expectation that things would be symmetrical. He's a little bit of a unicorn, which is why I think Blake had such an impressive season when they take into account that he can't control from the nipple down, but yet he has these very well-developed lats. Yeah. Uh, I think 
they do put structure seems to be a little bit less on the judging cards in regard to importance as much as size and symmetry is so they're not really too worried as much on the insertions or looking a certain way more just the overall mass and balance of the mass oh. okay i have a question um <laughs> if different wheelchair athletes are like different things are considered because their injuries are different does that mean that um like i guess why i'm confused is this Let's say that, I don't know, Dean is judged on five different things. Does that mean that Blake is judged on three, but somebody else who's who has full control of their muscularity up until the hips or something like that, they're judged on four things? Or, like, I, like do you understand the question? I feel like that was put poorly, but... I, I Yeah, the nuance is a little bit st- tricky to kind of navigate. Um and I do, this is something that I ponder myself, Liz, is how, or more so like the hard task that the judges have in front of them, having to weigh that up. Like, how do you compare someone like Blake with no like real midsection, like dominance or size compared to someone with the midsection? In like, logically, you think maybe there's a preference to the person with the midsection, perhaps, but it doesn't seem to be the case. And going off of the Europa um, show, there was a, a guy who placed fourth at the Olympia last year, has, you know, pretty solid midsection um, and everything's still able to work down there. And Blake still placed ahead of both of those two other guys. So, they, mm-hmm. I think they do just completely ignore that one facet and just solely work on what Blake has. Oh. So maybe if there's like 20 points to give, there would be more points in particular categories for Blake and less for people who are marked on five things instead of four or something like that. Yeah, I'm just trying to like the math out in my mind. It's not really judged on points. Like that. That's the problem. I think that's it. When you try and objectif- ob- like objectively measure bodybuilding, it can start to get very confusing. And that's the problem with it, but also kind of the fun of it. I would imagine if if the the major contributors to a physique that wins are muscularity, symmetry, and condition, they're the sort of top three things that are, are generally assessed. Then it would be what is Blake's muscularity, symmetry, and condition, the available tissue he has to change, and then what would competitor B's version of that be, and competitor C's. So if you have the capacity to control your abdominals, to grow lats, etc., you're going to be judged on that, but for the same three criteria. That's how I imagine it would have to happen in the brain, which would be very difficult because you can't not see what you see. Which you know, and Blake, Blake, is that your Blake, understanding? To, Blake, to your yeah, I feel like the ads going right. Mm. Yeah, yeah, right. I feel like they just judge us on what we have only, and yeah, like uh, Dean was saying, just how lean you are, how much muscularity you have in them areas that you can actually use, and yeah, you've got function off, I guess. Yeah. I think- wheelchair becomes like another layer of subjectiveness as opposed to the quantitative side of like looking at a points card. I feel like there is a lot less numbers written down on the scorecards as much as conversation between judges over the looks in front of them. Hmm. Does that frustrate you, Blake, or do you like that? I don't know. I guess it's quite annoying that my injury doesn't, you know, I don't have activation so low like some of the other athletes that are up to the top level like I am at the moment. But um yeah, I don't know. Just I hope it's all it's fair. Really How they do it, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah, and Blake both had conversations where we'd like to hope that the criteria is specifically applied when they're looking at them on stage. But as we've discussed, the look of Blake's midsection and, and quite a lot of the ways we tried to peak him were in alignment of trying to keep distension low on the mid, keep his mid tight so that it complemented the rest that was being judged. Like, although it wasn't being marked, it does affect the total look of the physique on stage. And that mm. is important, even though they're not actually scoring it. Um, so I think it's it can definitely, if the judges are not... Key or, or maybe not aware, and maybe we can dive into this a little bit about the Olympia, but maybe if they're not as well versed with the criteria for wheelchair, I think that subjectively people will be drawn away from Blake's physique, just naturally, like Dean said, what's in front of you. Um, but if they are judging correctly, it shouldn't actually make any difference to Blake's net outcomes. Oh. Are there rules around the wheelchair? Like what? The height of the backrest? Um, not really, no. So with our backrests, Basically, I've got to have one at a certain height so that I can 
like even balance and stay upright in my chair, especially when posing. Like I used to have it a lot lower, but I put it a little bit higher just so I could do the poses without, you know, flipping out of my chair. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so like some of the guys have no backrest at all because they've got full control of their core. Mine's like mid lower back sort of area. Um, just really, you just got to wear black pants. Um, and that's about it, really. They just don't want your legs showing on stage. That's all. Yeah, so the um, sneaky one that I learned was when you're watching the competitors come out, you can typically tell, except for Blake, he's the only exception to this, was typically you can tell by the height of the chair roughly where their injury was. But obviously Blake, being from like down here paralyzed, he actually has quite a low backrest. Oh. It was kind of a little bit like, oh, no, you're a bit of an anomaly here, dude. Oh. You yeah, know, I asked that question because Blake has such an incredible back. I was like, like how low can you go before it becomes an issue with regards to control, but then also gives you the opportunity to show off one of your strengths, you know? Yeah. yeah I've, I've played around with it a lot to try and get it as low as I can without actually, you know, when I do my double bicep pose, I don't actually fall backwards <laughs> when I'm doing it. <laughs> like yeah. I have to lean back into my backrest as it is. So I've had to, try and adjust the wheels a little bit and stuff so that I don't flip the chair backwards. It's just, yeah, I almost need wheelie bars on the back of the chair when I'm on stage so I can lean back. I was just about <laughs> you know, to say, right is here. this possible? Can you, get <laughs> you can get them. I don't know whether they fit on my chair, but like the ones that you have in hospital and stuff, they have them in, you know, they have the wheelchair with the wheelie bars on them so you can learn without flipping your chair. So, Would yeah. this be legal? I mean, I can't see why not because – you can get a wheelchair with them on it, so <laughs> get one. <laughs> I'd probably mean... tumble right over, but like I'd end up on the ground on the stage, like you know, back first, legs over my head. Yeah, <laughs> uh -huh. you, just, you just need <laughs> very, idea. very long wheelie bars. You know, like two meters backwards. You just and imagine the entry <laughs> to the stage too, just like a couple of streamers on the back, like Whoa. that'd be sick. You'd knock everyone out when you spun around, though. Like two <laughs> the this, quarter turns. Okay. <laughs> this is true. No quarter turns allowed. <laughs> George and Blake, I have a training question, if I may. So we have uh, different variables that dictate our approximate amount of sets that we give per muscle group. And one of them is just the amount of time that we have available to us to train within the week. But Blake, if you're only training upper body, George, does that mean that you're programming Blake an insane amount of volume or okay. for upper body because he's not training lower body? What I've learned from working with Blake is that everything I know up until now, I have typically challenged in my thought process. And what I would suggest anyone does when they try and think about quantifying how you would set up volume appropriately for this individual, you just throw it out the window. Blake does upper body more or less back to back day after day. It's not specifically just upper sessions. It'll typically be a push, pull, delt and arm, push, pull, delt and arm. But there is an incredibly large overlap for hitting muscle frequency back to back day to day. I think this does kind of come back to maybe saying that people in the general sense are a little bit too, what's the right way to say it without being rude? They're a little bit too cautious when it comes to training a muscle group back to back where they feel like, or oh, they have to have some an amount of time in between it it kind of comes back down to the recoverability of the individual and i've i've hypothesized this with blake a little bit more so in that if you also add up the volume he does in his upper body and then you weigh up the fact that he uses his arms delt uh, bicep tricep forearms wrist the same as we would our legs that adds another layer of additional stimulus that this man is going through every day pushing his chair i would say there's a resilience built up over the last 10 years to his capacity of work that can be done which allows for this style of training uh -huh. well, have you found that Blake that your your beginning capacity to obviously train frequently has changed or the amount that you can do per session has changed um since being in the chair I've kind of just done a lot of upper body I probably did more before being with George to be honest like I used to train just train and train and train and train and train because I love training so um yeah my upper body doesn't get that sore that's for sure like I do like 7,000 pushes a day and then do a chest session as well. So my triceps <laughs> and chest are working all day long and still, you know, recover pretty well, which is cool. Okay. How do you know you're doing 7,000 pushes? Do you have like a Fitbit that counts it as a step or something? Yeah, on my Apple Watch, it you can put it as like push setting instead of steps. So it, oh. it counts every time you move your hand. You can cheat a little bit and like just wave your hand around. but <laughs> oh. You can yeah. do that for, I do that sometimes if I'm trying to get steps at the end of the day, I'll run on the spot. 
and, it, and a yeah. couple of times I've just like scratched my head and then made my step target like accidentally cheated I was like oh you can do that uh, yeah I didn't move <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and is, is this something that you regulated George and and Blake yes I mean not it was cheating steps but yeah <laughs> <laughs> It was uh, many a time people uh, messaged me. Actually, it was one of the, the biggest questions I got about Blake's prep, actually, from people was like, how do you manage expenditure? And it was literally the exact same way as a step count, just with pushes. There was, you know, many a stories Blake put up on his Instagram story, wheeled down to the car park in the morning and was doing laps to and fro, getting his pushes in, fasted pushes, uh, much the same. Like, I'd say fortunately for Blake, uh, his injury for me as the coach was relatively simple to get my head around under the premise that the barriers are physical rather than an internal problem so there's not a lot that i need to really concern myself with in regard to organ function outside of digestive rate so like there's always 101 questions around how all does coaching work for blake but it is literally the same as it would be with any bodybuilder just applied to his recovery capacity and his very but there's far away um when we look at there's so many questions in my mind right now and I'm trying to think of like, well, which ones are relevant and not like too far away from the topic that we're talking about. But um, when we consider somebody's maintenance calories or their TDE, we usually go body weight times, depending on gender and body composition and stuff. I don't know, anywhere between 25 to 50 calories per kilo of body weight, right? How do you do it for Blake? Because I assume you wouldn't be considering his body weight from like, I don't know, the belly button down. Well, it's, uh, well there's I less resistance in the true? movement too, I guess, but. Yeah, I don't think it needs to be as overcomplicated as such as it would be used the same kind of baseline calculations and then auto regulate based on response, essentially, you know? Okay. Right. Well, okay. Right. Do you happen to know roughly what the, relevant or equivalent numbers were for Blake throughout like a prep like what was his calories in the off season and at what oh. weight and so um yeah, this also is another bit of a shock when people will hear this but like quite a lot of the other wheelchair competitors coming on their preps when you look at their stories they talk about what they're eating they're eating dust and it's just you know I mean Blake, Blake can elaborate here the dude can put away food like no tomorrow he's currently in his reverse at the moment or recovery phase I should say more specifically and he's on 4,000 calories yeah, well, oh, no way. yeah. <laughs> Blake, Blake has always had a high net need for food. This has been the same since even when I first spoke to him. You know, Lee, when we was talking about his first peak week originally, not working with me when I first met him, it, he was having to try and load a thousand gram of carbs in just to keep him full because his body would keep running flat. So he's a for, hyperactive motocross rider. Again, yeah. genetic me genetic metabolism obviously would dictate such a big player in this uh, as to his energy needs outside of his outputs. Um, but yeah, ge general basis was that food didn't really drop under, I've got my notes to the right hand side of me, didn't really get lower than 2,500 calories. At what body weight? Uh, so he was floating around 65 at the time on the dig back, uh, 68 on the time at that point. Yeah, so it's still like 30. So that's like what, 32 that's calories? That's yeah. like 37. It's, good. It's, it's high. So you're relatively high if you consider like, a normative calories per kilogram in a deficit, you know. There's very few people that get to sit at that number, that is for sure. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Rory. 4,000. Yeah, wow, that surprises me. That really surprises me. But then I also say to people, like, if you was to hypothetically put Blake, take him out of the chair, stand him up, and have that same relative mass as he has on his top to his bottom, his weight would be a hell of a lot heavier because he is quite massed on his frame. You know? Yeah, you'd when you be, actually look at yeah. Yeah, total muscle per his frame is actually quite stacked out. Yeah, like I would have to guess that you'd be – how tall are you, Blake? 171 centimetres. So. Yeah, like you've got to be like a, a solid 90-kilo bodybuilder on stage based on upper body mass, right? Which okay, which so. then when you when you go and do that, that's like 30 times body weight if you account for, for weight in normal – which is right back into the zone of expectation, you know? Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so when you look at carb loads, hmm. are, you, are you carb loading him a little bit less in total grams of carbs because you're not considering the muscles in his lower body? So mm, I, I, logically you'd think that, yes. But yeah. no, when you look at the sheer amount of food that he has to eat, it's not. we don't really think about the 
lack of energy being utilized elsewhere. The um the biggest problem we had when it comes to peaking, and this was something we discussed quite a, a lot coming at the back of his first competition. He had a, a couple of complications with his, with his gastrointestinal tract. And this is probably one of the more bigger barriers that we have to work around is that his GI does function once per day. Um, it functions more on a manual push that is kind of controlled by Blake. Um, and thus, we can't go crazy with loading food. Uh, he learned this the lot first time with prior what he was doing on his last um working with his last coach there were some complications with his bowels the other side of prep due to electrolyte uh, imbalances and just an over volume passing through the track at the time which meant for me i knew coming into this one i didn't really want to peak him at all i didn't want to wow. have an exposure window where we needed to increase food astronomically higher amounts from wherever it was on the low point so the whole prep was set up with the intention of making sure that when we were four weeks out we were done and it was a game of slowly kind of regulating back food to where it was tolerable from both physical GI comfort and also the look. Oh. Okay. Do, do, uh, Blake, do other, I imagine that you are in contact with other wheelchair athletes. I don't know. Is that a silly assumption? Yeah. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah, for sure. As, it is a silly assumption or you are in contact? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's in like you're contact. an idiot. <laughs> No, no. Yeah, in contact with a couple of guys. Yeah, for sure. Especially are, are after the all... last competition. But, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Are they all jealous about how much you can eat and your carb loads and stuff? They're eating dust. No, they haven't really said anything about what I've said of eating, but um, I've seen what they've put up on their stories. I'm like, dude, that'd suck. <laughs> like, <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> but, yeah. Okay. You know, there's there's so many interesting facets to this that I mean, it's all one in the same, but just a little bit different. You know, every injury is like, different too. Like every injury, you got more control of you know how you go to the bathroom and all that sort of thing as well. So, the lower your injury is, you might be able to go more frequently. Like I don't know, I don't talk about that stuff with the guys, but yeah, is that not something that? I mean, this is so general, but is that such a taboo, taboo topic that you guys don't even discuss it? within your own groups like girls we talk about like the vaginas and like the grossest things and nothing is off bounds but are there some things that are off bounds within that circle of people um i guess it's not really off bounds i just haven't brought it up with them guys i guess uh -huh. i'm probably one of the ones that can't go as often as like a normal person would i guess but okay. them other guys have got a bit more control than me, so maybe they don't have as much trouble, like trouble as me. So okay. I don't know. Yeah. And is that largely because there's just the the like the motility is slower, or just because it's a manual push that you have to engage and it's just easier to do it once a day? Yeah, it's just because I don't have activation of, of the muscles to do it. You know, like that's yeah. <laughs> it's as simple as it is. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it was quite fun navigating, keeping his midsection tight. Like when we run the, the Europa show, we did sacrifice a little bit of midsection fullness and distension to keep him really full when he went into the pro show. Like the thought process behind it was his condition was ahead of what I'd seen in the other amateur competitors. So I wanted to lean into that and make sure he was tight, make sure he was lean. And it obviously showed within the result. But going against the other guys who were already pros, they had the condition. It was about making sure he looked big enough and full enough. So we did sacrifice that a little bit and it was noticeable in our own personal opinion of the look on stage so coming into this next one for the olympia our mindset was to try and do the middle ground achieve the fullness keep the condition but have his midsection in a way that was comfortable for him more than anything else and there was some quite interesting tactics we had him eating at midnight you know getting his food in through the window earlier on in the day so that there was more time for it to pass from the upper points of the digestive tract down through lower and it was very uh, comfortable how what do you mean comfortable because like you can't feel it so how, how could it be uncomfortable more Look. like when I sit up, I have like my stomach will distend a little bit. Like I'll get distension of it and then I feel uncomfortable. I feel like I look like shit and just okay. don't want to present how I look. It's like when I eat a lot of food. So. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Got it. Mm. And then did because food choices. Like, yeah. Did food choices have to change around types or is it relatively similar to what was already being consumed? But just like you said, spread out. I mean, the beauty here was, like you said, George, it was set up in a manner that you didn't really have to excessively consume calories. So I imagine it wasn't too different. 
we kind of wanted this the whole way through because you know having his midsection so he's actually passing through correctly every morning means that the next day's food will go on top with no additional problems so the the digestibility of the foods consumed had been kind of locked in from the get-go and figured out early doors so that we didn't have these problems coming up closer to the point low food volume more energy dense foods um so like an off-season setting for blake there is definitely a bit more leverage toward less nutrient value more higher caloric value some things that you typically wouldn't necessarily look for in bodybuilding for whatever reason that may be and tend to kind of open up for him to be a bit more of a smarter decision when you consider the digestive rate we um we did actually what we do notice straight away obviously as you'd normally assume when fiber goes in when fruits and vegetables are consumed more fermentation he does see a visual change on the gastric distension so for him which i very rarely ever seldom do we did pull his veggies out or reduce them down to minimal on like the day of comp or the day leading into comp oh. right okay you mentioned that you hit your midsection to get your abs visible you can't feel that at all, right? I can feel like the muscle contraction, I guess, but it's a okay. really weird sensation. Like if you were to stab me with a knife, I probably wouldn't feel much at all. It'd be just like a bit of pressure area, like, oh, what happened? <laughs> so, yeah, I can okay. hit my stomach like super hard and it just it just makes the muscles contract from like a spasm point of view, I guess. So because you can't really feel it, um, mm. is there – like I imagine there's a risk of you injuring some internal organs in that area. Is that a concern for you? I don't hit that hard. <laughs> like okay. they, they're getting better and better too. Like the more I have trained and I can do like cable crunches and stuff now, a lot more than what I used to be able to. So they're just getting stronger. I don't know. It's just the only way I can actually tense the muscle is to tap on my stomach. Like I can I just push on it with my fingers and it'll work. I don't right. have to actually hit it as such, but just like tapping on it, it's just quicker to do it rather than just poking at it. <laughs> I, I imagine no. like a full yeah. on punch in the stomach. So that's, that's not what's happening. Yeah. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> no. It's like, maybe once the abs are on, but yeah. <laughs> it's like a chest pump. Liz. like, you know, you see people like, yeah, like, you know, like that kind of thing. You'll see, you know, he'll just uh -huh. be like bang, bang, he'll be like tap, tap. And then you'll see the abs go like this and then he'll go into his pose. Yeah. Yeah. Quick story. I uh, did boxing for a hot minute. At, like I think year three of uni or something like that and I remember we were we partnered up in boxing class and the instructions were one person lays on the ground the other person stands next to them the person standing had to get like I don't know like a four or six kilo ball and as hard as they can like throw it on the abs of the person on the ground so the person on the ground had to and like get really tight in their abs but mm. I'm a little girl I'm like all of 58 kilos and there weren't any other girls in my class that I can remember? So dudes throwing at full force at my stomach. I'm like, oh, something, something's going to, like, burst open. Yeah. <laughs> so that's sort of what I had in mind when you were saying you were hitting your abs, but not quite. <laughs> not quite that extreme. That's <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> a pretty strong arm. You might be hitting him harder than he thinks, but no, it's um, pretty cool to see because they kind of have like this window of like switching on for about 10 to 15 seconds before they kind of start to drop off again. So that's why you see every pose. It's a freshen up of the hit. Oh. And have, um, have you guys considered, like I, I imagine you have, like is there an option for even like electrical stimulation while doing ab training or anything like that? So I thought about this when we come off the back of the Olympia um, showing and Blake, to my not to my know, knowledge, was already doing that in his physio work to his lower erectors. So it was already something that was being utilised as a tool. Yeah, cool. Mm. Yeah, very cool. But that, that same so theory. are you going to do it on your abs? Mm. Uh, at the moment, Liz, we have like during the prep from just creating some type of movement that replicates an abdominal crunch. So using the leverage of the cables to allow him to balance himself into just going through the motions without actually using his midsection to do it has changed the intramuscular inflammatory look to them. And in the same way that he can't feel his lats, but he still trains and pulls through that motion as if he is, he's still growing a lat. It's what I hypothesize will be much the same result is that over time we will get some change in look of muscularity. It might not be crazy massive changes, but it will slowly over time keep getting better. Whether the electrostimulus is necessary or not, it's something we can definitely look into, but uh, for now, it has started to make some good headway. It can't hurt, right? Exactly. Well, yeah. Okay. Oh, man, I'm, this, 
I'm even thinking, like, is this is this this George's moment where he says, "Hey, like, guess what, mate? I know how we're going to like re-engage these neural connections. It's mushrooms and weight training." <laughs> we can try. I, <laughs> and I only, I only said this, you know, I was listening to a podcast the other day. Uh, it was called Death, Sex, and Money, uh, but it was on another podcast called Search Engine. And there was a, a guy there who had had injury, and um, uh, it was it was like a, a base jumper. And then yeah, he told me he wouldn't wouldn't walk again. Eventually, kind of learned to walk on on um, on on crutches. And he got high as a motherfucker at some festival. And while he was high, he was basically, he said throughout his life, he was having these conversations like, legs, please do this with me. He'd have a lot of internal conversation to try and get them to move, you know, because he was struggling. And then he had a moment where he's like, I could feel all of the muscles within my body that I hadn't. And I realized that I was actually moving things that I'd never moved before. And I was like, am I just high and this is happening? Or have I actually just like unlocked this particular thing? But he's like, I admittedly, like, I don't know if it was just a time issue, like that I'd just been doing more physio or if it was just the moment that I had it. But yeah, so it was the, the headline was something like that, like mushrooms helped me walk again or something. It was funny. <laughs> this is all the proof we need. More mushrooms, wake. Yeah. So we're mushrooms. As you can imagine, my head's been running on ways that I could try and improve neuronal growth and neuronal connection. I'm not saying I'm going to try and fix or treat anything, but just how can we get that last percentage that's going to make a difference to his outcomes? Mm. And there was nice. a lot of new things coming out within, say, the recreational space and also research space that are starting to show promise in this area. So it's, it's definitely something mm. I'm keeping on top of for potential considerations that me and Blake could think on as we go. But mm. whether or not he's up for it's- the market... <laughs> Maybe not the Look, hallucinogenic we, we ones fully to start with. It. <laughs> no, it's so fun. Um, I know in Australia, ketamine and mushrooms are now approved for, uh, res- what is it, treatment-resistant Non-resist- PTSD yeah, yeah. and depression. And mm. I wonder if it's, not that you necessarily need everything to be legal to do them, but, like, Blake, if that was a concern of yours, is it a legal? is it legal for... I don't know, somebody trying to improve neuronal connections because of a injury. Not yeah, maybe. Like I'd try for sure if I'm allowed. <laughs> or can can get a hold of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can help. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like there's a lot to do within bodybuilding performance enhancement that actually massively benefit Blake and that stuff yeah. that he from talking to other in, people with injuries and specialists over the time frame, like the use of growth hormone, for example, he notices massive changes in his ability to control areas that he typically doesn't have connection to, maybe closer to the top injury and stuff like that. Like it does carry a lot of weight in helping improve outcomes by utilizing certain things in pharmacology. Um, so yeah, it kind of, it made a lot of validation of decisions we made with PEDs a lot more open to us, more than what you'd actually expect. You'd think that the box is more closed off, but it's actually much more open than people think. Is that because you think it's a little right. bit more experimental? Like even like the neurological benefits of D- heavy DHT derivatives? Yeah. Yeah. yeah super interesting. So, uh, so what's the improvement that is required? I mean, pretty, pretty wild. I mean, I don't know if we – do we even – I don't even know if it was so clear of just how fucking epic this season was for Blake, right? Like, it, it wasn't just the, he kind of went to the Olympia. It was, he turned pro, won the pro show, went to the Olympia within three weeks? Was it? That. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not a bad way to start. And then and then place at the Olympia? Seventh. Seventh. Unreal. So what's the uh, the improvements uh, necessary, you think, to to continue rolling up here? I think maybe Blake can obviously follow on from this afterwards, but I think from my reflection, watching what I saw on stage, uh, Blake definitely looks mm, what I'd say the most complete in regard to muscle on frame, but is lacking compared to the structure of the other athletes being like, if they was to stand out of their chair, they're six foot tall and this wide. So for him being slightly smaller on the clavicle width, although he does look like he's more stacked in muscle per frame, he's going to need to be a lot bigger to overshadow the sheer size of these people and their stature on stage. What I took from the Olympia was that they do put a big focus on size. Being bodybuilding, they do put a big focus on size. And 
that I think for me is, is adding that extra mass to Blake is what's going to make the difference between him climbing into that top five, top three placing. Condition wise, he was one of the most conditioned on stage. And that was a comment that was passed around from multiple different people, including judges. So we know we have that. Oh. We know we can keep improving that. It's not something that's just dead set. It can get better. Um, but for me, it's the size that we just need to add and that maturity in time. Yeah. Okay. Where's it got to go, Blake? Blake? From... Yeah, I agree. It's like another few kilos in the next year or two. Definitely um, make a big difference, I reckon. Yeah. For sure. What do you think that you did really well um, leading up? Well, basically, it's your your whole bodybuilding career that led up to this point. But let's just talk about the prep. What do you think you did really well? Um. I stuck to a really, really like strict routine. So like I got up at the same time every single day. Um, I did my morning cardio, ate some food, you know, did the same thing every single day, even to the point where I stopped going to work um, before the London show. I started working on London time before I got to London. So like I was actually eating in the middle of the night. I was awake all night. I went to the gym in the middle of the night. I slept during the day. So like I, got my body adjusted to the time before I even went to London. So I feel like that helped a lot with just how I progressed and how the prep went. It went so well because of that, I guess. Yeah. So think, you were like the world's most prepared man. To allude on this, to me. <laughs> yeah. To allude on this a little bit. The conversation, Dean will obviously say this, uh, validate this as well, that we have with most athletes that spout big goals of wanting to turn pro or wanting to go to the Olympia. It comes back down to those actions that they then perform that would dictate the end result. It's all good saying these things, but if your actions don't then validate what you're trying to achieve, then you know it's just words, it's just hot air. Blake truly embodies and has embodied since, you know, from his last showing, what it means to be a pro. He has acted and held himself accountable to uh, uh, the expectations of a pro bodybuilder in every single facet and, and way. You know, not missing a beat in his meal timings, not missing a beat on every single gram of food consumed, not missing a beat with training. And it, I know it sounds like it's very rudimentary stuff, eat your food, go train. But consistently doing that, stringing that back to back, day after day after day, every single night, the same wake up time, same bedtime, he truly has put 100% of everything he could into this result and continues to behave in that manner. So that that what I would say is what he did well was he fully embodied what it meant to be a pro much long before he actually turned pro. Where's yeah, well that, that come from, Blake? Where is this sort of like I don't want to say motivation, but this fire to do everything that you possibly can? Where did that start? I don't know. I guess like ever since when I used to race motocross, I just if I'm going to do something, I just do that one thing. Like not much else goes on in my life i'm a pretty boring person other than the bodybuilding side of it like that's all i do and i'll tell, tell anyone that that's what i do but um yeah i just i have the goal in my mind to become you know now it's mr olympia in wheelchair so um i'm just gonna stick to doing it until i get it oh. just okay. so you're just like a super focused person and you're not somebody who feels like they need six different elements of their life to focus on you like you quite like just being the sharpest at this one thing yeah yeah i only need that one thing and it makes me happy and drives me towards the goal that i want to do yeah okay. when when did the focus on becoming uh or it would have been earning your pro card begin for you because i think you said it was 10 years ago was the motocross injury yeah just over 10 years now yeah yeah and then just to take a massive assumption, you kind of got into weight training, I suppose, to come out of that from a rehabilitation perspective. And then you found joy in this to the point where it then became a thing you did. So like, how long ago was that like intensified motocross focus shifted now into becoming a pro or when was that even a, an option? Um, well, I thought about competing like probably six years ago now and I just didn't think I was big enough or good enough um, and just, the accessibility of shows for a wheelchair guy in Australia um, isn't really there either. you got to ask the IFBB, which they'll put a show on for you if you ask them in Australia here. But, um, yeah, like six years ago, I started really tracking my food and everything myself. Um, my brother-in-law just kind of helped me out with a little bit of what food I needed to have because he's been a personal trainer for a good, like, 15, 20 years now. Um, so I started out doing that and then just training tracking my weights and everything probably six years ago as well. 
So I've, you know, I've tracked all my weights for the past six years as well. Oh. Um, yeah, so then from there, I know I got involved with a bit more exciting things in the bodybuilding community, I guess. And um, then I was like, you know, I need to compete, make the most of this. So last year I competed and did the Queensland State Show and then did the Australian Championships as well. Um, I won both of them, but, yeah, then just had to travel overseas to go for that pro card. So, Yeah, yeah. because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, there was like uh, not enough people within the wheelchair division within Australia for it to be deemed, you know, uh, as competitive enough, I guess you could say, uh, to then Mm. earn the pro card. Mm. Yeah, I think they said they needed like six athletes on the stage before they were able to hand it out or something, yeah. I mean, that, that that has changed. I've heard multiple different conversations from the same person where once it was three people, then it was four, and then he said six people on stage. Oh. Mm. Okay, what is it? Uh, no, I think that um, that kind of carryover from the mindset, what I said at the beginning there, was he was like this in motocross, and because of who he is and how he likes to live, bodybuilding found him as opposed to really him finding bodybuilding like his behaviors and how he lived his life gravitated towards this so well like it just overlapped and interlinked into success as a bodybuilder because of those behaviors and habits he had prior Mm -hmm. it's like easy for blake to do really hard things because he naturally is kind of drawn to that yeah yeah. it was it was awesome listening obviously meeting blake's parents and obviously talking to his mum a lot about who he was prior to bodybuilding and, and hearing that this wasn't something that developed now short term. It's been his behaviors for a long time. It was pretty cool to see. And it kind of just made me go, ah, that's why this man doesn't miss a beat. This is why I don't really have the typical kind of problems and conversations I have with most competitors in the amateur space coming up, trying to teach them to learn these behaviors and what it means to to act like a pro. Like he kind of just already had the nuts and bolts there. Oh. Do you have siblings, Blake? Sorry? Do you have siblings? Yeah. Yeah. I've got two elder sisters. So, I was always sort of one of us against the other all the time. <laughs> Do you make your siblings look really bad? Because I imagine your siblings aren't as like focused and accomplished, or is that not true? Are you all like um, that? I don't know. They don't really have like set goal like me in a sporting um, background sort of thing. I guess they just do jobs and have kids and families and stuff which is cool as well i get to in, get involved with that which is cool <laughs> i love that they just do the jobs and have kids that just gives them <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that's funny um uh, all right so so is it a secret that you're the golden child is it spoken about i don't know i, I wouldn't go that far i won't say that George? But maybe yeah <laughs> george what did what did mum say did she allude to uh, her no, 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 no. <laughs> I will. I will say uh, it does seem very evenly spread. Oh, that's fine. George is like, I didn't okay. even know he had siblings. She never spoke about them. <laughs> <laughs> There's your answer. <laughs> um, um, so I think that everybody finishes a prep and kind of thinks like, damn, I, I really need to do this better next time, or I really stuffed up there. It doesn't sound like you have that element, or no, no, no. I can't think go. of anything that I really could. Um, improve on to be honest yeah i don't know i think i can add some to this in that i don't think it's necessarily something that blake could do better or or do differently that he hasn't done yet but there are definitely other avenues within his progression he can then look into and focus on that are going to continue to progress him as a bodybuilder although he didn't do anything per se this time around being now in the pro ranks and this maybe isn't so much necessary to like the physical side of bodybuilding but being now in the pro ranks and now having such bigger higher goals to achieve there is other layers to this within presence within who you are as a person that have to whether you really want it to happen or not is a part and partial of being that guy if you want to be mr olympia your representation of the sport of the brand of the industry that is bodybuilding and thus there is an expectation to try and develop yourself into this person who can you know speak at public places and do these things and be present in social media and all these other kind of things that people don't think about in the amateur ranks and i think that oh. would be working on this to develop blake into the athlete that can be mr olympia as opposed to just physically having him look like mr olympia oh. yeah okay i wouldn't have thought of those things it's so true 
And uh, also his gift is sometimes what I would say could also be a little bit of a curse. As you know, that all in mindset can sometimes lead to burnout. I haven't seen it yet with Blake, not yet, but it's something that I'm constantly just trying to think about monitoring so that we know that there is whatever that slight little bit of balance needs to be. It is in- integrated, whatever that does look like. Oh. So George, me and you had a, like a, a really uh, quick discussion on a team meeting, was it last week, about balance. And um, we kind of came to the conclusion that balance for me looks so different than balance for Dean or balance for someone else. Like if I spend all day thinking about training and nutrition, like I'm going to feel burnt out pretty quickly. Like I, I need more things in my life. Like I'll get training done, I'll get nutrition done, fine, but I just don't want to spend too long thinking about it. Um, whereas like... I don't know, Dean, his kind of recreational wind down is watching like stuff on YouTube about gear. Like, okay, fine. But it sounds like Blake's is different again. Like that dial is turned up. But I do find it difficult to believe that even people with the dial turned up really far need nothing else ever. But maybe that's just my perspective. I think... I'm right in that. I, I have that same thought, which is why Blake could tell you probably annoyed him the amount of times I had these conversations with him. I was like, you know, do you want to go and do stuff? Is there other things you want to go and do? Is there all these different things? You know, we're in Vegas for fuck's sake, like the Olympia's done. Like what else is there that you want to do? And he generally was just quite happy being a bodybuilder that that brought him fulfillment. So like I said, I haven't seen that kind of burnout or close to burnout on him yet. So I think his level of balance is just on the sliding scale right at this end, but it seems to be okay for him. Because oh. okay. I'm all the same as you. I think it's also yeah. like okay to acknowledge though, that you can still be a little bit sad, but in response to that, be the best that you possibly could. And, and that maybe might be enough of the driving force. Like, you know, like I would have foregoed friendships to have been a, a professional footballer for a point in time in my life, for sure. And I would have, I would have been very like okay with acknowledging that I was foregoing friendships because this goal was more important to me. So like, even if I was like willing to admit, ah, this, I, I, it'd be nice to have a lot of friends and also do this. I couldn't have all of the friends and also do this. So guess what I'm choosing? Like, you know. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting one. Like, was it like the allure of the Mister Olympia was obviously there? I don't know if you actually thought that it was possible that you would have ended up there this year. Um, Maybe it was a want or a dream, but not necessarily a goal. I don't know. Um, you, maybe you can talk to that. But having now been there, was there anything like unexpected in the whole experience? Um, so I definitely didn't expect to end up at the Olympia this year. <laughs> uh, it didn't even really cross my mind until we were aiming for that London show where I could have potentially become a pro, you know, got the pro card. And then won the pro show and got the Olympic qualification. But, like, yeah, in, at the start of the year, George and I, we were thinking, oh, we probably won't even compete this year. And I sent George the dates for the London show. And we're like, yeah, we can do this for sure. So we, you know, cracked in, got it done, went to the London show. But um, I still don't even, you know, know how I got to the Olympia, to be honest. So I'm still trying to take it in. <laughs> I've still been thinking about it every day. It's like, holy shit, I made it there. Like, now we're, you know, I've got to get better at the Olympia. So, um, credit definitely needs to go to Blake here in this. And the, the conversation about him not competing this year was based solely on the first conversation we had about coming on board after his nationals comp. And I was like, look, the physique to, to be worthy of the pro card, not just get it because of the day, needs to be built. He left for whatever time frame it was, come back and then wanted to hop on. And when I looked at him, he was a completely different human. In in, in every facet of muscularity, I was shocked and jaw dropped at how big he'd got from A to B in such a short time frame that then I opened up the conversation to go, yeah, dude, London can happen. In fact, the improvements you made in that short time frame, I was not expecting. And it just meant that that now become a reality, but also same as what I said to him when I met him in nationals, it generally wasn't a case of, of if it happened, it was when, and just making sure that the work was done to create that reality. Oh. And is the qualification process for wheelchair guys the same in that you have to win a show in order to qualify? Four points. Yeah. Same, same, same parameter. You can get points. I think the points might you be less. You can get points? Okay, yeah, so there's, because there's no, no points in any of the other ones anymore. Oh, they removed it? Yeah. It's, it's top, top, <laughs> top three for classic. Top five, top four, or top three for opens. I can't remember opens. They get the 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 
the qualification immediately for the next year. But then everybody else has to win a show in order to get to the Olympia. That's good. That's good. Yeah. So oh. I'm interested. I mean, that, that was what it was for 2024, the whole of 2024. So I, I don't, I'm interested to know if it would be the same for a wheelchair if there's not as many competitions available for you to actually qualify for. I'm not sure. I think the points that they required was a lot less to qualify for the Olympia, but there were two people on the Olympia stage who hadn't won shows that had both qualified just on points alone. And that were the two people that Bake beat at Europa. They okay. both qualified and then got there that that was like their last show to get enough points to go mm. and, and now being a pro blake and also for, for you to probably answer this question george the olympia is the show and by default of that being on every 12 months and it only being one show a year where it is the show to win now your timelines change as a coach and client in that it's not always a possibility for you to consider competing two years or 18 months from now because you probably want to compete at the Olympia every year if you possibly can. So now the timelines are all dialed up a little bit. Like what does the next sort of 12 months kind of look like competitive wise? I guess I'll, I'll jump in on this one because we are in the process of dis discussing these plans at the moment. Now uh, I did get asked if he wanted to do the Arnold in Ohio and providing that the typical post -comp, uh, post comp prep checks blood work echocardiogram and his mental and emotional state are all primed and in a good position we are going to go for the arnold to get the early qualification for the olympia so that we can then put our focus into adding more size before that time comes um if the parameter changes and we decide that for whatever reason the Arnold is not the smartest decision we will be trying to get that qualification pretty close to the Olympia again so that we don't jeopardize potential growth time mm. this is the thing like as you said it kind of all these kind of timelines now go like this and it's like right we've got this time frame to get as much mass on as possible how do we do that in an ethical safe way that's not going to potentially jeopardize the prep to come with mass fat mass and everything else so um, it's definitely a lot more pressure on the timeline. There's a little bit more speed ramped up behind everything, but it will either be a higher qualification or just before the Olympia for qualify, then go. Mm. What's that, 22-ish weeks? Oh, it's only 18 weeks away, yeah. 18, there you go. Yeah, like March 16th yeah. or something like that, isn't it? Uh, it's the end of it's the end of February, start of March, yeah. Okay. First of March, I think. Mm. Yay. That'd be cool. I mean, yeah. that, I mean, that, if there's ever another stage to step on for the second time, <laughs> may as well be the Arnolds. Like, why not? Yeah, yeah. that's all really crazy. Um, was, uh... Blake, I'm oh, sorry. Go on, George. I don't care. No, no. I was just, I was just um, aware of the time, and I don't want to take up everyone's time. So I was just going to go to tell, say to Blake, thank you for coming on. It was really interesting, and go to our wrap up segments. But did you have something that you wanted to add first? I was just going to say it's a very interesting category of judging in bodybuilding, uh, wheelchair bodybuilding specifically, and that the Arnold just prompted this conversation. The person who won the Arnold and beat the current new Mr. Owen wheelchair come sixth, one place in front of Blake. And he just, uh, like, just shortly prior, won and beat everyone at the Arnold, but yet he comes sixth out of 10 at the Olympia stage. And the guy that he comes set, who comes second to him, then won the Olympia. So it's uh, similar as you'd expect with bodybuilding in any case. It can ebb and flow based on who's in front of you. And it very much does matter which judge is in front of you, what set of eyes are in front of you. And I will say their preference to what they like in bodybuilding will make a massive difference on the placings. Yeah, and then Arnold's is a whole nother kettle of fish because Arnold's is a little bit differently judged even in all of the categories uh, compared to the Olympia. So, you know, maybe it's less about stature and more about lines and muscularity and, and presentation and, and whatnot. So exciting times. Very. Yeah, I'm looking forward to um to seeing where this goes, Blake. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah, you guys make an absolute killer team. Yeah, George is like my brother now. We've spent a few weeks together and he shaved my back and stuff, so we're pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that is the one bonus. That's a bonus as a coach, George. You don't have to shave his ass cheeks. I mean, exactly. I've, done that. I've done that for Cam and, you know, it will never be the same again. That was exactly what I said to Blake. I was like, when he asked me about it and he was talking about it, I was like, dude, there is nothing that could phase me in this. When I shaved my best friend's ass crack before he went to compete, like doing your back and scrubbing your back because you can't reach it, 
minor. We're all good. <laughs> Dean's first comp, I got the tanning roller and I was rolling his glutes. And I was like, look, I'm really sorry, but I need to like get in there a bit more. He just like bent over, like no undies on. And I was just like rolling away. And he's too lean to have any fat to cover the important parts, you know. So I was like, oh, it's okay. Did you not supportive get to- partner. <laughs> <laughs> to wet willy him. Not Just, me. <laughs> you check my temperature, yeah. Do you know what, George? It's definitely something that I would normally do. Um, but Dean, particularly anyone, kind of loses their personality and sense of fun when they're slowly starving to death. And um, I remember that morning specifically Dean's fun dial was turned down so far that I'd, I'd never really seen angry Dean before, but that, that wouldn't have gone down well that morning, let me tell you. I can't imagine angry Dean. I don't think I knew he had to bore it. <laughs> yeah. He exists yeah, it's, it's rare, but it's there. <laughs> uh. um, okay. So we like to wrap up the show with a less shit tip, Blake. If you could give our audience one tip on how they could be less shit, what might that be? Could you be less shit? Um, <laughs> as a human, no. <laughs> yeah, as a bodybuilder. As a bodybuilder. Um, I guess just set a goal for yourself, and if you're going to do it, do it. Like, don't say you're going to do it and not do it. You know, make it happen. Yeah, get out of bed at the time you set for yourself. Yeah, get out of bed when you set your alarm. Don't stick around for another 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Get out of bed. Start the day. Yeah. Are you giving Liz this advice, Blake, or? Hey, I, I don't get know. out of bed at the same time every day. I do it. If I say I'm going to do something, I do it. What's this No, you do No, it's just the bedtime. You're a little bit of a snoozer. You're not a snoozer, but, like, you're like, a, ah, the alarm. You know, especially oh, when I start. complain about the alarm every morning, yeah. but I'm yeah. out of bed within 15 minutes of the alarm. This is true. I'm just posting. Yeah. So that's an everyday thing, though, so that's okay. <laughs> every day I complain about the alarm, and every day I get out. <laughs> exactly. I'm consistently complaining. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So there was this really interesting study on like 2.4 million um, My Fitness Pal users. And predictions of success or failure based off particular variables and uh, i'll link it in the show notes i'm forgetting the name of the study but what they found was the biggest predictor of success was people doing what they say they will do in the first seven days of trying to achieve a goal because what we're doing is we're setting standards for ourselves. we're sort of like flexing that muscle and it gets easier over time so people who set particular calorie goals or step goals or something like that if they didn't quite make it within the first seven days, there was like a 95% chance they weren't going to reach their goal ever. If the first seven days they were sort of on point, there was a 95% chance that they were going to do it. And so that kind of speaks to your less shit tip, which is like if you say you're going to do something, do it. And maybe you need extra accountability to get it done. Maybe you need someone to check up on you, or whatever it is that you need, but like figure that out. Mm-hmm. I think it helps to have a really big understanding as well as to what is required of you to achieve some of those big goals so that sometimes people are a little bit less quick to voice them out in the open without really knowing what it's going to take. Yeah. That, well, yes, yeah, I, I suppose I'm thinking of something like I'm going to get out of bed at 6am every morning, but maybe George, like what you're talking about is someone saying I'm going to be Mr. O like there's a million different moving parts to that. Isn't there? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, you, you're talking to the people that we mentioned before, George, to say, oh, I'm, I want to be a pro, but the actions that they partake in every day are not even remotely similar to that of what a pro would do, unless the pro is just some genetically gifted freak. But um, I think too many people get caught up in that, trying to pretend they want to be something but aren't actually interested in doing the things necessary to be that person. Yeah, yeah. All right, something worth sharing, it can come from anyone. Um. Does anybody have something they think our audience might find value in? So, Blake, this is usually, it can come from you or the boys, it doesn't really matter, a book, a podcast that you like, a food combination, I don't know, an app, anything at all. Okay. Hmm. Um, I was going to say one that's on Q again, we can link this in the show notes, but it is um, just on, on in relation to what I was mentioning before about the uh, coolness of 
mushrooms. And that is there's a Netflix series on uh, fungi, as he calls it. I fucking hate how Paul Stamets calls fungi. But anyway, he is the mushroom man, so he can call it whatever he wants. And yeah, it's like The Wonderful Life of Fungi or something like that. Um, I'll put it, we'll put it in the show notes. It's a really interesting watch just on all of the different applications and how, how mushrooms work and how they interconnect. And I'm not talking about just hallucinogenic ones. I'm talking about mushrooms in general. It's cool. Watch it. I think mushrooms might be the closest things we have to aliens. Ooh, They're oh, fascinating. Octopus. What was that, George? Why? Oh, yeah, know. that's true. Don't they have like seven hearts or something? They're fucked. Like they, they are not <laughs> fucked planet. You can't tell me that that evolved the same way everything else did. Did you know that when a female octopus yeah, has a baby, it's inevitably going to die because it just starves to death looking after the baby? standard parent. I learned that from I guess basically it's called like is it Octopus My Teacher? Have you guys heard of that? Something like that on Netflix. That is that is a Netflix yeah. Mm. Good one. It's a very good one. That's something worth sharing for sure. Okay, cool. Um are we at would you rather? Yeah. You ready for this Blake? It could be it I've could heard be, a few of these. <laughs> it could be incredibly inappropriate. <laughs> That's all right. I don't think of these in advance. <laughs> Uh, so I'm, I'm like the Harry Mack of uh, Would You Rathers. <laughs> I'm prepared. Um, Blake, would you rather always have to get around in a wheelchair that is, like, embarrassingly pimped, right? So I'm talking, like, I don't know, fire flames and just bedazzled. Chrome Whatever spinners. you would find. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> It's not cool though. It's like so over the top. It's embarrassing, um, and it's your only chair ever. Or hmm, hmm, boys, jump in if you have another idea. Or have a super shit haircut. Like your fringe is long, but the rest of your head is shaved. Oh. Couldn't I just shave the nostril? <laughs> no, no. So no, this is you keep it. There's no loopholes like this. You can't wear a hat. Mm-hmm. You, you can't cover your pimped chair. So it's like a reverse mullet? Yeah, I suppose so, like a long fringe. but It's a front no mullet. Hair. So would you rather drive around in your chair, pimped to the high nines, or wheel around with a front mullet? How long is he going to have the mullet for? I'm going to go with the ch- I'm going to go with the chair because, like, I can get out of that thing and get away from it. So <laughs> No, you're in, it. you're in it. You're in it. No, but I can go to bed. Way. I don't sleep in my chair. <laughs> Okay, sure, sure. Okay. <laughs> Except for bed. You, it's what you're going to the gym in. It's what you're going to the supermarket in. Ah, doesn't worry me. <laughs> Look, we were talking about okay. before being it's representation of the brand that is, uh, you know, the Mr. Olympia. It certainly is a way to build a character. You could take, you know, the wrestling idea and go, you know, I am the Hulk Hogan of Australian wheelchair bodybuilding and here's my flamboyant cut. <laughs> <laughs> oh man you'd stand out on stage with that thing that's for sure absolutely I feel like as an australian he could do either or and no one would really probably do anything yeah. australians can get away with awesome. a lot yeah <laughs> there's a lot of bad haircuts in australia and they're they're celebrated but they said they tend- bad haircuts and shit dad shoes in other new fashion like what's up with the crappy new balances guys please <laughs> sorry george Oh, I just shit. bought myself my first pair of New Balances in like a decade, so I'll eat my words. But they're cool; they're not like the dad ones. She, she got the trainer version. She didn't get the she didn't get the yeah the pedophile style long laced ones. You know, I'm actually wearing them now for YouTubers. I'm going to take a left shoe off and show you, and you guys can all tell me how sick you think my shoes are. Look at these; aren't they nice? Tell me they're uh, not the best New Balances you've ever seen. And yes, I have massive feet for a girl who's five foot. <laughs> okay, so by everybody's silence, I'm going to guess you guys all hate my new balances. Fuck all of you. I no, you I just think it's hypocritical to think that some are that of which a nonce would wear and that those are not. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Really? It's judgy. I accept that. <laughs> I don't know. A particular kind of person typically wears Yeezys. A particular type of person typically wears TNs. You know. Oh, that's true. What, what do you say to the person that has all of the above every one of them they can do you have i have yeezy <laughs> i have dinosaur stompers 
What are the fucking dinosaur stoppers? The, I'm the going pedophiles. for the Crocs. Oh, the pedophiles, that's right. Okay. <laughs> I couldn't stop it. Yeah, I don't know. You confuse me, George. Crocs. Okay, George, it, this is this is this is where it matters most. Is that why does the person purchase the item? That's what matters to me most. Most people, I think, purchase the Yeezys because they want Yeezys. Most people purchase the really ugly version of New Balance because they've just become popular for some unknown reason. You know, it was like, you're the kind of guy that would have bought Crocs 25 years ago because they were comfortable. Because they're comfortable. Else, you know, so there's a, there's a difference here. Yeah. No, absolutely. Dean knows a girl who liked these really ugly shoes and he said to her, why do you like them? And she said, because they're expensive. Yeah. So no to her or no to that attitude. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you're right, George. Some people might be wearing ugly shoes for the right reasons, which is I like them or they're comfortable, not because I want to fit in. It's fashionable. I'm just odd. <laughs> you are odd. It's true. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think you can wear those shoes when you have a beard and then wear like dangly earrings and some tattoos and stuff because you're not the normal person that's wearing them. It's like Mike Pearson. You know, like yeah. people can chuck off at guys for having painted nails and then you have Mike Pearson. You're like, nah, don't worry about it. Hot <laughs> <laughs> pink. <laughs> it's perfectly fine. <laughs> it's gangster. Is so good for such a big person. Like you don't see many like huge bodybuilders that are fashionable. They always seem to struggle at it. And he just seems to do it well. He actually looked pretty dope in denim overalls. I was like, how do you look okay in this? And somehow it works. Yeah. Just works. Um, all right, guys, we'll wrap it up. Blake, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you guys for having me. It's been a pleasure. And uh, five-star review. Find us on Instagram. Say all the good things about us. And we'll see you in the next episode.